Fred and Virginia Waring have been married for 27 years, and throughout that time, they've been as popular with each other as the Pennsylvanians have been with the country. It is my pleasure to welcome them now, Fred and Virginia Waring. Welcome to Overeas. Thank you. Hi, Jim. Fred, good to have you with us again. Glad you're here. Virginia, you for the first time. I want to talk about something that happened to you a couple of years ago. You had a, had a stroke. Yeah. I assume it's a minor one because you look like you're going strong now. I struck out in one pitch. What happened? I really don't know. I just <coughs> leaning, was leaning over and kept falling. He was, actually was, uh, ho well, we spend our uh, time between his tours at, mm -hmm. in, in Palm Springs. And he was there for a rest, mm -hmm. and he just suddenly keeled over. Well, the part we want to get to, since he's recovered so nicely, is that you had, as I understand it, a 12-week concert tour booked and had to go. And you couldn't make it, and Virginia filled in. What was that like to conduct the Pennsylvanians? Well, uh, it, once I realized that he wasn't going to be able to tour for a while, it suddenly hit me that... Uh, there were 33 people who would have been out of work, and uh, there were 12 weeks booked, and you know what that means, one night stands, all those theaters all over the country. And worst of all, his uh, tradition of 65 years would have been down the drain. So I timidly offered my services, and by the time I got back east, uh, I only had a day and a half. And although I had been a concert pianist, I had never conducted, and I, I, ha and I had you. never watched him. I had been doing all my other things all those years, you see. So it was not easy. Uh, I often think about it now, and I think the reason I was able to do it was the fact that I was thinking of those other people. Mm -hmm. Also, I realized, too, um, I had a few things going for me that I hadn't, that had sort of prepared me. I'm a graduate of a woman's college, Mills College. Mm -hmm. And somehow they sent me out of there with the feeling that, and this was a long time ago, that you can do just about whatever you want to do. And sure, get married, have children, but don't just sit there. Mm -hmm. And all the years that we've been married, I've been doing all sorts of things, accepting challenges, mm -hmm. etc. The other thing is you cannot be a concert pianist and get up on the stage and fall apart. Right. <laughs> so, and the fact that I was a musician, I did have some of the things in my ear. Sure, of course. But people thought that I had been going all these 25 years on the road with him, which I didn't never, do. Never so heard. I didn't know the routine of the show, and he has about 50 songs. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, look at his split, you well, see. So the, that was the hardest part. What was the reaction to the, to the Pennsylvanians, the choir, to have I'll Mrs. I'll never wearing? forget when I turned around to conduct them, their eyes were just bugging out, you know, because they didn't know what I was going to do, and I didn't either, <laughs> really. My ear knew, but I didn't know what sure. to do, how to get that sound. Fred, what did you think when you finally saw her conduct? Well, it was weeks later, they came out, the tour took them down through Florida, out through Texas, and they finally wound up in Phoenix. So I was able then to get to Phoenix, and I heard her performing at the uh, Sun Dome there. Mm -hmm. 7,000 feet. 7,500 senior citizens had assembled, and I got into the back of the arena and watched, and I was, I was just bowled over. I couldn't believe it, how well she was doing and how wonderfully the audience was responding. I felt like a very unnecessary lurker there. But... She invited me on stage, and I did conduct one number. I want to talk to you about something else. You've been conducting choral workshops back since 1947. When did all that begin, and why? And tell me a little bit about the background. How much time have we, Jim? Well, a few minutes, but... Well, it did start in 47. Actually, it began because we were coerced into it. Our system of singing had caught on, obviously, as reports indicated through the radio channels. Mm -hmm. And a group of high school music teachers 
had written to a request permission to attend our rehearsals during their Christmas holiday to see if they could learn a little bit more about it and maybe go back home with a few of our arrangements. Mm -hmm. Well, I was prevailed upon by one of my staff members who was editor of the music journal which I had owned. And by the time it, the date arrived, 300 hmm. school teachers had arrived in New York to attend our rehearsals. And NBC did not have the time or the space. Mm -hmm. So we went and engaged the, the Astor Hotel ballroom, took our rehearsals over there, and it was going pretty well. We were trying to show them our systems, and I thought it'd be nice to have somebody else come over and help me out. So I invited Irving Berlin and Dick Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein to drop in and just say hello to make these people feel good. They came and spent three or four sessions with them. You must have made them feel ecstatic. Oh, they, they just felt <laughs> marvelous. Well, they went home after they had made certain that they could get our arrangement of the battle hymn at least. Mm -hmm. So we had it Xeroxed for them. Then they prevailed upon us to publish it. And when we went about that, we founded the Shawnee Press Publishing Company. And that was the first number. By the way, Irving Berlin and Dick Rogers gave us the rights to many of their songs to publish in choral form. Oh, that's great. To help, but, but help us get started. Now you've expanded it from music teachers to uh, college and high well, school we, students. We, we had the, we continued to have the workshops in the summers at Shawnee. Three, four hundred. In fact, we had a thousand every summer for about 20 summers. And I got a little bit tired trying to impress music teachers with new ideas which were not in textbooks. So I decided to have youth come in and we invited high school choirs from the vicinity to come. I would spend 15 minutes teaching them one of our complicated arrangements and they would sing it. And it uh, flabbergasted the teachers who could not learn it in three, four days. So the following year we started having just youth to a workshop, mm -hmm. alternating with the uh, seniors. And that's been going on ever since. We, youth have given me a marvelous inspiration. Fred, you've been at this for 60 years now. What, what do you think, or maybe Virginia, you ought to answer this if he, I don't know whether he can be objective about it or not. What's been the secret of his success and the choir's success, do you think? Well, I would say that, that I discovered that the English language is the most beautiful language, singing language, mm -hmm. that I have ever known. I know that other countries love their sounds, but we cannot understand the languages of the other countries. And I don't think that we should try to sing other languages here in America. We should sing our own beautiful language. We discovered that sounds within our language are so beautiful when sung well. They do not compare. We teach our kids to learn to sing the song, not the music not the words, but the combination of the two. And I remember that the songwriters went to a lot of trouble to make beautiful words and beautiful music, and they blended them together into, without the use of the wearing blender, by the way, they blended <laughs> them together into song, and the song was written for one purpose, to sing. You can't whistle a song. Mm -hmm. You can whistle a melody. It's hearing and, and singing so we everything sing those, that's, that's there. And we divide all those sounds <clears throat> and sing them. Let me, uh, one final question. I want to ask. You've gone back to, to concert piano playing again, haven't you? What, you what's that been like? Uh, well, it was not easy layoff? after 25 years. And uh, Steinway used to give us, uh, I was part of a piano team, mm -hmm. and they gave us pianos for years. So after 25 years, I called up By Steinway. By the way, it was the best piano team you ever heard, Morley and Gerhardt. I called up Steinway Concert Division and I timidly said who I was and who I had been and uh, so pretty soon the phone rang and it was a Mr. Rubin who had been middle way in the Concert Division and he called up and he said, uh, I asked how much it would cost to take a $30,000 grand out and he said, I think you worded it badly, when do you want it? Uh -huh. So that 
made me nice. It made it easier because it's almost impossible to get up and play a difficult piece cold oh, as I had yeah. to do, you yeah. know. Listen, I want to thank the two of you for being here with us today and, and sharing parts of your lives and, and uh, telling us more about the Pennsylvanians and Virginia. Nice to be here. Thank you. Look forward to your next visit. We're very proud to be here.